Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We're so excited to such a, see such a big crowd tonight uh, for this exciting topic. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, to one of tonight's co-moderators, the new co-director of the Center for Public Leadership, Max Bazerman. He's the Strauss Professor of Business Administration, has spent time both across the river at the business school as well as at the Kennedy School. We're glad to have him on our side of the river a little bit more. So please join me in welcoming Max to the forum. Good evening. We're delighted you're all here uh, for, this, uh, for this event this evening. Um, this event is part of the Behavioral Insights Group, which is uh, a research arm of the Center for Public Leadership. And to this evening, we have an event that I've been really looking forward to. Two. Uh, to my left are three um, amazing colleagues. First, uh, co-moderating with me is uh, Nava Ashraf, who's my colleague from the Negotiations, Organizations, and Markets Unit at the Harvard Business School, and she's also a faculty affiliate at the Poverty, Poverty Action Lab, the National Bureau of Economic Research, and the Behavioral Insights Group. Um, and our guests this evening, who will be answering the questions, are Dick Thaler and Cass Sunstein, you all know that they're the authors of Nudge, you can read all about them, um, but it's pretty amazing to have perhaps the world's foremost behavioral economist and the world's foremost legal scholar in the room with us at the same time. So this is um, really a phenomenal opportunity and we're delighted that, that you're here with us. Um, so to, to get us started, um, I wanna go back to uh, something I read in the uh, in the acknowledgement section of your book, where you talk about having lunch at a restaurant called Noodles, which I honestly know nothing about. Um, and and I, can you take us back to, to that time and tell us what you thought you were up to and whether where we are is what you thought you were writing when you were discussing Should that I book? Tell the story of how, so um, I, gave a talk on Save More Tomorrow, um, which is a program to help people save by c getting them to commit to saving more tomorrow. Uh, that's the, the name. <laughs> and um, I gave a talk on this over at the economics department. And uh, my, they had a, it was a conference, my discussant was a guy called Casey Mulligan, who is a hardcore Chicago school economist. And so the, the talk showed that we had sort of been able to get people to quadruple their saving rates in a few years. And Casey was sort of sputtering. And at the end, he said, well, but isn't this isn't this paternalism? And so I was sort of taken aback by that because that's really the most insulting thing that you can say to anyone at the University of Chicago. Right? It's, it's worse than communist, I think. And so, so I said, well, I, you know, I guess, but, but there's no coercion. You know, be, this is an opt-in system. Um, so. So it's not the usual sort of paternalism. Um, it, it, it's some other kind. I don't know. Maybe we could call it libertarian paternalism. Well, that really made him mad. Uh, but the next day, um, I was to have a weekly lunch at Noodles, um, Cass's favorite restaurant. And um, I said, Cass, you know, I, I came up with an interesting phrase yesterday. Uh, you know, that may, you know, maybe we can think about it. Of course, Cass's immediate reaction was, well, we ought to write a book. <laughs> because, you know, Cass writes books. <laughs> so, um, you know, and uh, yeah, one thing led to another. But, but uh, I feel like saying Governor Romney, but you didn't answer my question. Um, you, you, uh, you told me I didn't have to. <laughs> um, I was interested in what you were thinking about um, when you were started, starting this out. Did, did you think that you were creating an architecture that was going to create the big unit? Okay, so the, the libertarian paternalism idea 
was originally uh, a short article in the American Economic Review, Papers and Proceedings, and uh, a short article in the University of Chicago Law Review. Short is relative here as elsewhere, maybe five pages in the American Economic Review and maybe 50 in the University of Chicago Law Review, both really short. You can guess who, who wrote which of you. <laughs> And so th th those two articles, I think what, what we thought was there's an idea here that grew out of the exchange thus described, which was um, uh, generalizable and of, um, of interest in multiple domains. And the fact that it took off in the way it did, I certainly didn't anticipate. And the clue, uh, point for the University of Chicago, was we had market evidence, which is that it was a working paper before it was actually published in, on some website, and it got like a lot of downloads. Now, of course, you didn't have to pay to download it, so it's not a perfect market test. Nonetheless, to press print requires action. The default is not printing. And so when we saw the downloads, we thought uh, maybe there's a book here. I, I, I think the fact that it ended up having the kind of traction that it did, um, I at least didn't anticipate. And uh, the, the idea was it was a, a really interesting idea that would uh, apply in a lot of domains that maybe we, we couldn't come close to thinking about. So, so that's very helpful. So I want to go back in time to when I started doing behavioral decision research, um, studying decision biases. I, I think it's clear that the hope of early decision bias researchers was that we were going to then figure out how to debias human judgment, which ended up being a path that just didn't work out. We don't know how to debias intuition. Um, and you came up with a very different framework, which is to basically take advantage of what we know about human intuition and design systems that will lead to more rational or more societally beneficial decisions. But now there's lots of people all over the world who are using this, this structure to intervene. How are they doing? Uh, um, are you comfortable? I mean, clearly, a lot's going on, but are you comfortable with the interventions? Are you comfortable with the diffusion? What caveats do you have? Where is it working? Where is it not working? Well, I, I'm very comfortable with it. Um, uh, the interventions usually have the virtue that if they're not ideal, they're not really harmful. That's usually the virtue. And if they, they work, they can have a really big payoff. So there's stuff happening all over the world. Dick mentioned Save More Tomorrow, which is having uh, big, and so far as we can tell, beneficial impacts. Uh, there are some recent papers out on uh, disclosure policies, including the policies in the uh, Credit Card Act of 2009, uh, suggesting that one little nudge is saving $74 million annually for consumers. And an assortment of reforms, which include mostly nudges of saving American consumers in overcharge fees and late fees, $20 billion a year. So that's a pretty good success story. Um, the success stories are proliferating. With respect to default rules, they ra range from the, the large, as in automatic enrollment and automatic escalation for savings, to the littler but uh, meaningful, like an automatic double-sided default for printing, which is having a very big impact in saving institutions. I'm looking at the dean here. I don't know what your default is for printing. <laughs> saving institutions money and also having uh, a not trivial environmental benefit. So uh, alertness to default rules. There's a rule we did in the Obama administration that's uh, giving just one little rule, which is a piece of a large assortment of initiatives that's giving over 250,000 children uh, meals that they're legally entitled to, that they were getting because they had to opt in, even though they were eligible and state and local government knew that. So these are uh, tales of beneficial impacts. And while a manipulative person can certainly use defaults or nudges uh, for bad, um, at least in democratic countries, we're not seeing that. Yeah, I mean, let me elaborate on that a little bit. I think it, it's certain that not every 
exciting finding uh, that gets reported will uh, be replicated all around the world. Uh, for sure that won't happen. It's likely that the most impressive findings will shrink uh, when they're replicated because that's statistics. Um, and some stuff just won't replicate at all. But the, the thing about uh, what's going on in the UK that I'm proudest of um, is not so much necessarily the behavioral insights, but the culture that everything we do, we're going to test. And um, if we could just get that idea across, that if we want to try something, you know, we should uh, see if it works. And um, so, you know, I, I think that if we do that and there are lots of people looking over everyone's shoulders, um, eventually we'll sort out what works and what doesn't. And the, the biggest test of automatic enrollment is the UK just launched something that's been in the works for 12 years, uh, which is an, essentially a new national 401k plan. And it has automatic enrollment. And there were lots of people saying, no one's going to sign up for this. Everybody's going to opt out. And the first couple million people uh, were exposed to this. And the opt-out rate is less than 10%. So it's time to bring Nava into the discussion. And you can either go with questions, or you can talk about some of your views about the importance of context and how that affects the use of behavioral economics in applied context. Um. So actually, I, I want to go back to this sort of the culture of experimentation that you were talking about. Because as we think about the, the findings that are, say, robust in the lab, like sunk cost or crowd out, that seem to not replicate a lot of times when we try to take them to the field. Or we try to put them in different contexts. We try to design things in different cultures. And it really depends very much on certain situations. That culture of experimentation seems critical. To, in, to as a way of solving this. But the other part of it is the deeper and subtle understanding of the science behind it. So of course, a lot of the people who have been involved in this have been people who've studied this extensively. How do you see, when you're thinking about going forward and bringing this to scale and increasing amounts of governments all over the world having nudge units, for example, how do you see that science, that deep understanding of the subtle science making its way into the culture, along with the culture of experimentation? You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that you need deep understanding of science. Danny Kahneman, <laughs> uh, and, and I'm entitled to speak for him since I just <laughs> substituted for him uh, the last hour. So I am Danny Kahneman. Um, he always says that. Um, well, we argue about, he says there's no psychology in Nudge, and I claim there's first grade psychology. But there's certainly no deep psychology. And um, I, I don't think that, you know, I'm all for people having a deep understanding of psychology, but um, no, nothing that we've done um, or you've done, as far as I know, has involved a deep understanding of psychology. <laughs> um, the, the, the deep understanding is if you make something easier, people are more likely to do it. And that price is not the only thing that matters. Now, you can go a long way with those two things. Now, that's not to say that, you know, if you had Danny Kahneman in every meeting that he w wouldn't improve the discussion. Uh, I, I, th I think the bigger problem, so I was, I was at a, I told Cass about this, I was at a meeting a couple weeks ago um, at 10 Downing Street, and the amazing thing was there was, there were 14 
representatives of departments, uh, different agencies, each of which had created their own behavioral insight team. Now, so that's the good news. Were all the ideas they presented great? No. And the, uh, the, I think the biggest trap is you, you sort of get a list of the behavioral tricks, defaults, and uh, social norms, and blah, blah, blah. And you have some problem, and you tick off the list. And the lecture I ended up giving at the end of this meeting is start with the problem. Try and understand what the problem is, what you're trying to solve, and and then think about what the barriers. But I, I, I'm not so worried about deep understanding so, of social that, science. But that's a deep understanding of being able to listen and understand the context, understand the end user, understand the person on the other side, right? It maybe doesn't require a deep understanding of psychology, but it requires a willingness to engage in that process. And I think that that's exactly what I was trying to get at is when you think about here are the top 10 things that you can do as a nudger or as a choice architect, and you want to have a generation of people who are becoming choice architects or behavioral economics engineers, um, the ch challenge is precisely that. How do we go beyond the, the list? Well, I think what Dick said something very important. So we're at the Kennedy School, which is a problem-solving institution. And when I went into government, if my uh, first words or first weeks, I said, you know, it's study behavioral economics, nudges can be effective, it's really time for that. I think some people would have said it's really time for you to go back to Harvard. But that, that's, that's not the right approach. Instead, the idea was there's you know, a financial regulatory reform bill which is being discussed. It has a consumer bureau being created. What, what's it going to do? And insofar as it's focused on disclosure, um, what kinds of disclosures should it think about requiring that will actually help? So that would be a, a problem up approach or there's an obesity challenge, a very serious one in the United States. Um, you can think of any number of standard economic responses to that problem or you can think of approaches that maybe would work including cafeteria design and reminders and uh, various things that might have an impact that are behaviorally informed. If you go over the Affordable Care Act, there's a lot of talk about mandates and requirements, but there's a lot of um, nudging in it in, form of, in the form of disclosure requirements and things that are supposed to make markets work better. The credit card reform problem is overcharges and how do you get consumers to protect themselves against that. Uh, with respect to um, uh, uh, telephone payments, they're often on cell cards, people, cell phones, people experience bill shock where they, they went over, they didn't know they were going over. Uh, you may have found recently, if you're getting, oh, going over, you're notified of that. Does that happen to you? Happened to me. <laughs> uh, that grows out of a regulatory initiative from the FCC, which was very much behaviorally informed. So I think the, the right way to think of it is, is uh, not the list of, 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 of quirks or anomalies or surprises and uh, not an abstract thing about cultural differences or heterogeneity, though that may turn out to be second order important when you think about the problem. But what is the difficulty that our institutions, private or public, are trying to solve? And you may see an expanded universe of tools. Just to go back to, to your Paulus experience, Cass, in, in the US government, and Dick in, in the UK government especially, when you think about the biggest obstacle that taking some of this and bringing it into policy, so you talked about culture shift in terms of experimentation, but what are some of the biggest challenges you've seen and, and ways of sort of helping to overcome them? I mean, aside from Congress. Aside from Congress. <laughs> yes, there are some major challenges, but you know, I mean, in general, we have challenges with bringing anything that's sort of evidence-based decision-making into practice. I, and and within the Obama administration, I did not find serious obstacles. Uh, the, you know, there's something called the food, food pyramid, which was the 
icon, and it was changed in favor of uh, a, a food plate, which is much simpler and more intuitive. And the, you know, people wanted the thing to be helpful. So I think the, an obstacle would have been if I talked in abstract or if others had talked in abstract theoretical terms. That's just not uh, the, the currency. Uh, or to talk about empirical findings for more than a minute. Uh, but to, to focus on you know, what can be done so that when uh, consumers are facing credit card bills that are going out of sight, they can protect themselves. And then people in government are smart. So they'll think, if you do that, what will be the unintended consequence? Will it create an increase in annual fees? Will interest rates jump? You know, they have the standard repertoire of, uh, of, of economic concerns. And then the, the testing point turns out to be crucial. I think the, 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 the obstacles I'd point to, and I think that, that really should be a footnote, it's an opportunity. It's a fantastic opportunity, both in public and private institutions, charities, uh, corporations. I had an opportunity to meet, meet a high-level official at McDonald's the other day. And McDonald's, you know, isn't completely perfect in terms of healthy diet, but they're doing a lot of stuff which has choice architecture in ingredients in it. So the opportunities are, are, are uh, uh, really as, as high as you could imagine. Uh, in terms of obstacles, I'd, I'd refer to two things, I guess. One is time, and the other is and really related, and the other is testing. So people are very busy in government. They have a lot of stuff to do. And to focus on X is always at the expense of Y and Z and, and A, B, C, D, E. So uh, the Mullah Nathan Shafir book is highly relevant. There's a bandwidth issue. And that's relevant to the testing issue. So uh, Dick is completely right about the importance, and it's, it deserves a headline, of advanced testing of things. And in the US, there's much more emphasis on that than there was five years ago. But if you you know, if you have a disclosure requirement that Congress has asked you to go forward with by a date certain, to have a, a randomized trial in advance, you might just not have, you just might not have the time to do it. So the, the kind of advance nailing of the problems sometimes isn't feasible on a tight mm -hmm. timeline. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can actually share, I just, um, because there's an example that might be interesting here as we think about bringing this into policy and part of the reason I brought up the question. So. Um, a couple days ago, I just got back from Zambia, and we had done, in order to make the things move into policy quicker, we have done experiments together with the government that are nationwide. And the experiment we did, we asked the question they wanted to, which is how do they, how do they recruit civil servants for the government in a new cadre of civil service that they were doing, and how you find more pro-socially oriented people, people who want to serve the community, and what's the effect of making salient in posters and adverts a career incentive versus a serve your community incentive. Is that actually gonna draw in different people? So this is a complete salience type of argument, right? You, half of the country, basically half of the districts, we had in one poster, half of the districts in the other poster, and we find a particular result um, that it draws in a very different cadre of people and they have very different performance a year afterwards. So now, uh, so I was meeting with the, the Minister of Health and I say, okay, here are our results. And he says, that's great, let's, let's do this poster that works. Right? So we all did this thing together, let's do the poster that works. And, uh, and so we go to try to implement it. Now they have a group that are going to implement it. And I, I find the poster that's about to go out to print. And they say, well, we just made a few tweaks on your poster. We used the poster, we just made a few tweaks. And, and I said, actually, the, the, the point of the research was that those tweaks can really matter in the types of people who show up and the performance, that the health outcomes that they're actually implementing in the field. Right? And so there are so many steps even in a situation where you're deeply collaborating on the question and the implementation, how do we, you know, when, Dick, you were talking about the people who are watching over, having those people watch over. How do we create systems? How do we, you know, each of us in, in this room or other places, be part of a system that allows and facilitates this to actually happen? You know, I, I think w w one misconception is that this is peculiar to government. Uh, I, I think it, my experience is exactly the same is true in business. That very few businesses are open to experimentation unless they're in a, a very specific. So if you're 
doing direct mail advertising, that's your life. If you're, uh, you know, if you're Google and you're uh, trying to get people to pay attention to ads, again, that, you, you're living through experimentation. Mm -hmm. But if, if you try to convince some, uh, some firm that they should rethink how they, what kind of people they want to hire, and may, maybe you should hire this sort of person rather than that. And let's run an experiment and hire 50 people that don't fit your mold. Good luck with that. So um, I, I, I think that, that, that's a universal problem. Yeah. And uh, no, you know, not, every, not everyone respects uh, data and research. One, one thing that I think your question suggests that's very important is that choice architecture is needed for choice architects. Yes. <laughs> so a, a constitution is like a large scale choice architecture. And you could have, with respect to things like what you're describing, a choice architecture that's a safeguard. So the office that I was privileged to, uh, to head in the first term of the Obama administration uh, is really a convener of a, an interagency process that oversees all significant regulations. So if there's a test that shows this poster works and this doesn't, the regulation had better incorporate the finding or someone of the numerous eyes that go over the text before it's finalized is going to find out there's a, there's a mistake. So if you can create a, a culture in which the empirical stuff is properly translated into requirements, then probably those bad things won't happen. Yeah, you also have to somehow incorporate opportunities for learning. Yeah. So, you know, the food plate is better than the food pyramid, but it's certainly not the ultimate answer to obesity. And we, we somehow need to have laws and, you know, God knows Obamacare is not perfect. It's not the apocalypse and it's not perfect. And, you know, one of the biggest frustrations in observing Washington is that you, go, you put something forward that obviously could be improved in a thousand ways and the obstacles that uh, right. get in the way of fixing things. Right. I think it's the, probably the most important uh, structural initiative in the last four years. I wonder how many of you have even heard of it. It's part of Executive Order 13563. Oh, that's it, one of my favorites. It's, 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 it, who could resist? It's like, a, it's like a poem, doesn't it? The very <laughs> yeah. title. And the, the operative section is called Retrospective Analysis. And it's exactly what Dix describes. It mandates periodic reassessment of rules on the books by reference to evidence. So it's called retrospective analysis to see if the thing needs to be fixed, uh, scaled back, streamlined, simplified, expanded, repealed. And that is, so we've talked about several different things. One is, is nudges. Another is careful ex ante analysis as through randomized trials. And a third, which we're now talking about, is retrospective analysis of things that, that have uh, been in place. And actually, billions of dollars in regulatory costs have been eliminated by virtue of the operation of retrospective analysis. And this, it doesn't have, I think, quite the intellectual excitement of the ideas of libertarian paternalism and choice architecture, the idea of ex post assessment, but in terms of uh, the operation of actual human lives, like whether kids are getting food and whether small businesses are getting hammered, the, it, it has uh, a big potential payoff. But given how much experimentation is happening around the world, it seems like there's got to be a way to make sure that, that the knowledge that's generated through that process is fed back into, even as other people think about new ideas that need to come out or new nudges or new ways of understanding. Um, It'd be a shame if all of that experimentation that is happening and the knowledge that's being generated actually doesn't feed back. Well, we, yeah, I, I agree with that, and we need 
we need opportunities for convening and for publishing. I mean, there's a new journal that Greg Fox has helped start that I think, what's it called? Behavioral Science and Public Policy or something? That's close to that. So, something very close to that. And one of the things I've urged Greg is to make sure that that won't be a journal that's limited to academics. That you, you want the people in these agencies all around the world to be able to report the findings of their research and maybe they didn't do it in a way that would get it accepted at the American Economic Review, but uh, they did something and we can learn from that and somebody else can replicate it and maybe do the tests better, but uh, there's all this stuff going on. We have to make sure we have a way of uh, disseminating. A, a little example for you that it, does, it involves something of great importance, social and intellectual, which is the social cost of carbon. To issue a regulation, it's critical to know what the social cost of a ton of carbon emissions are. The U.S. government came out with an interagency process in 2000. Nine, I believe, with an initial number, but it committed to learning as there's new information. And in 2013, it had an update based on uh, the new integrated assessment models. The numbers changed significantly. So this, this is completely doable. So as we get ready to transition after I ask one more question, we'll be opening it up to the audience. And there are four mics, so feel free um, to, to line up to ask a question. But before we get there, I'll ask the question that, that may be most relevant to this audience. There's a lot of students here because they find nudges behavioral economics to be a fascinating topic um, in an applied way. So if there are future choice architects out there, what do they need in terms of um, academic background? What do they need in terms of um, institutional understanding in order to find both job opportunities but also opportunities where they're going to be able to make the world a better place um, through, their, um, through their skills and opportunities. So if you could provide that kind of career guidance, that might be very helpful. Uh, I'd say two things dwarf everything else, and they are energy and enthusiasm. <laughs> so uh, to, to have uh, some uh, education here from Zeckhauser in particular, that's very good. <laughs> um, to have uh, a lot of economics trading is uh, nice, but uh, not necessary. Uh, I think if, if you have a sense that this is something you really like, and if you have some domain where you want to put ideas to work, uh, so long as the energy and enthusiasm there, it's going to happen. I mean, my wife is UN ambassador. She taught at the Kennedy School. And when she was in the White House the first term, one of her achievements was the Open Government Partnership, OGP as it's called. Of course, it was the president's initiative, but she played a large role. And it definitely has a, uh, broadly speaking, um, uh, feel of non-coercive um, freedom, respecting, choice-preserving uh, strategy, where governments all over the world are disclosing stuff, uh, even if they're not particularly democratic, and that's you know that's turned out to be an opportunity. There are people at for profits, at non nonprofits that are. Uh, you know, if you have a sense of what the possibilities are, you'll go in directions that the authors of the book couldn't have anticipated. Yeah, I think, so I completely agree with that. We have, I'm, I'm delighted to see the most energetic and enthusiastic person I know who's responsible for the uh, US Behavioral Insight team. And I think her She's and, in the audience. Um, Maya, <laughs> the great Maya Shankar. And, you know, if I say how much of what she's managed to accomplish in six months is due to her PhD in cognitive psychology and how much of it is due to energy and enthusiasm, um, you know, I think 
I put a lot of it on energy. Um, now, but the, the team that she's creating and the teams that will be created around the world will need different sorts of tools. So you need to know people who know how to do randomized trials. You need to have people who have the statistical training to evaluate those. You need people who have a deep understanding of psychology, but um, not no one person has to have all those skills. So can I Please? just jump in here? Just because um, I am a big fan of energy and enthusiasm, but I've also seen the challenge of trying to train a group of behavioral economics engineers, bring them to different contexts, try to come up with different projects, and the importance of technical skills actually in that process and having that there both on the experimenting side and on the structure of your thinking in terms of economics and psychology. Yeah, they're not sufficient. I mean, if you have energy and enthusiasm, but if what you really like is tennis, and that, that, then you're not going to do much with behavioral economics. So, yeah, so, I mean, you, clearly we need both, and um, uh, any successful team will have some people with strong technical skills, some people with strong um, psychological skills, but they're all going to, you're going to need strong interpersonal skills too. If, if you go in to talk to some head of some agency and you start lecturing them on uh, this is the way you ought to be doing things, and here are the really cool things I know that you don't know, that it, and you'll do your job a lot better if you know them. Um, that, will, that will be a one-time meeting. And Nava, you teach an MBA, MBA course that's open to the rest of the university. Um, what's your response to what you need to train? Actually, exactly that. The intellectual humility and the ability to listen to the other side as the number one most important thing, which allows you to see the end user and understand the decision-making process that could allow you to design the, the choice architecture, and gives you the political economy skills to actually put the insights into action. Microphones are open. I see movement toward a, a couple of the microphones. So. Um, as people are headed there, let me uh, remind you of um, uh, HKS forum roles. Please identify yourself. Um, please ask a short question, and question marks have a question mark. Uh, questions have a question mark at the end of them, um, and only one question per person. So up, up there. Uh, first of all, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, my name is Cameron Teriani. I'm a freshman. I'm actually a member of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, and I'll be asking the official forum question. Uh, on behalf of the committee, and it's uh, to what extent in your work have 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 you found that there are unintent unintentional or unintended consequences of well-intentioned nudges? I mean, there's unintended consequences of everything, <laughs> so there are bound to be unintended consequences, and uh, you can't live in fear of those. So. Of course, there are unintended consequences. Give two examples, I guess. Uh, one uh, is related to the credit card stuff that I, I mentioned. Uh, it is the case that the credit card reforms produced, recent study, $20 billion in benefits uh, for cardholders. But uh, about, uh, somewhat under 10% of that is eaten up by increases in annual fees. Now that's a completely anticipatable fact that if you impose these restrictions, annual fees are going to cost, going to increase. It's an unintended consequence. I think it's not an unforeseeable one, but it's it's not good. Uh, there's that. The other Dick's really the expert on, but uh, if you have automatic enrollment in savings plans, yeah, I was thinking of that too. Uh, uh, the risk is that you could actually increase participation but decrease savings if the default contribution rate is low and stays constant over time. So if you default people into plans and then they are contributing 3%, that's the default rate, it might be on balance, and there's some data suggesting this, 
that you're going to have an unintended consequence predictable from the behavioral point of view, because inertia is really powerful, of driving savings down. So those are, those are two examples. They're kind of, uh, uh, I think, productive examples because the first shows the power of standard economic thinking, right, that, that kickback, uh, markets kickback. And the second shows the risk that a choice architect uh, who's attentive to one aspect that's good about a default rule might miss another aspect that's not so good, both of which come from its stickiness. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll add a third one. When we wrote the book, we thought we, we, we had a, you know, a tentative table of content and we penciled in a chapter on organ donations uh, with the expectation that we would write a chapter advocating presumed consent, so an opt-out system for organ donations. And the more we read about the literature on that, we realized that's actually a really bad system. And it's a bad system because Virtually no countries implement it in a pure way. Um, the doctors end up still asking family members um, for permission. And in a, in a presumed consent environment, the family members have no idea what the donor's wishes are. Uh, all the donor did was fail to opt out. Uh, which doesn't signify much. So um, we changed our, changed our minds and advocated what we now call prompted choice. And so, uh, you know, but um, I, I can tell you then, uh, when we implemented that in the UK, and Gordon Brown had wanted to do presumed consent, and there was a lot of complaining. So um, the very first thing we did in the UK was implement this uh, presumed consent, or uh, sorry, uh, prompted choice. But then we, the, some lawyer at some motor vehicle department decided that it's really important that after you've been asked, do you want to be an organ donor, you're shown a very long list of organs and asked for each one of those, <laughs> or, would you like to donate that? And uh, that had a very big unintended consequence. <laughs> and I'm ready to wring that lawyer's neck, and, um, but cooler heads are prevailing. And so, yes, it's a great question. Great. Up front. Hi, my name is Sar Medoff, and I'm a first year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. And slightly going off of that last question, you mentioned that with a lot of the nudges, that the potential downside is relatively negligible. That if it works, that's great. And if it doesn't work, you know, no one really loses. Would you say that the same is true when you have amateur choice architects? When you have someone who's read the book and thinks it's a fantastic idea and something they'd like to bring to their organization, but maybe they don't have the resources to create an entire behavioral insights team. Do you think that the risks of amateur choice architecture are as negligible as when it's instituted on, say, a government level? I'm thinking what would be, the, I'm sure the answer is yes, but I'm thinking what would be the examples. If you have someone who you know, has the equivalent of inserting a not in every sentence, so they say, I, so they say well, I want to uh, use a default rule that's going to save the organization money, and they're completely, conf they're like opposites day. So they, 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 that's the level of incompetence. So what they do is they say, the way we'll save money is we'll have a single-sided default. And they're just completely confused. That would be very bad. Um, uh, or you could have someone who's malevolent, you know, a, uh, probably be hurt in the market if the market's functioning well. But you could have someone who's an amateur from the ethical point of view, though not from the competence point of view, who says, I'm going to really trap consumers in various ways because I'll use small print to enroll them in something where their credit card is charged $50 a month, and they won't know until it's too late, and I will have gotten the money. Um, I, I mean, one point that I think bears on what you say is uh, choice architecture is inevitable. So, so you might have someone who's... Uh, uh, well-read 
uh, choice architect, also an amateur. But they won't be introducing choice architecture where it didn't exist before. They'll just be, I guess, more intentionally producing something that's either bad for them or bad for others. So you have to think more concretely. You, you could have someone who knows that social norms matter and has a mistaken view of the right way to describe them so as to produce the desired behavior. And that, that, that could be bad. So, uh, so the, the answer is yes, as with all tools. Uh, I guess the, what, what Cass meant when he first made that statement is the, the whole idea of, of nudging as opposed to shoving is that the amount of harm you can create is reduced because there's an opt-out. So you, yes, you can, so if you have automatic enrollment at a very low rate, you may be making people worse off. And we know the solution for that, which is automatic escalation. But, uh, but if you default people into something terrible, they're gonna figure that out and opt out. So, um, so that's one limit on how much damage um, inept choice architects can do if they stick to the principle that um, no shoves. Here's my favorite study for the last period, uh, last few years, on, the, on exactly your point. Uh, in, with the OECD, there was an effort to test what happens if you change the default setting on thermometers. If you turn it down one degree, the default setting, you get a significant savings in terms of energy use. Uh, saves money, environmentally good. If you turn it down two degrees, not so much. I think it's profound. <laughs> it's because one degree colder in winter. Is it centigrade or? Centigrade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah centigrade. <laughs> what, 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 one degree colder in winter, that's, that's not so bad, even if it's centigrade. And you might just say, yeah, whatever, that's fine. <laughs> Two degree colder, people are going to say, sorry guys, I'm going where I want. That, I think that tells you a lot about human nature, and it uh, <coughs> confirms Dick's point about the limited, which is not to say zero, uh, bad, bad possibilities from incompetent nudging. There's, a, there's a, another example like that is the, um, an office that I was in where they had set the paper towels that when you click, you'd get a very small paper towel. And so everyone would do it <laughs> twice, right? So that's the same idea. You can, you can go overboard. Thank you. To my right. Hi, my name is Claudia Newman-Martin. I'm a Master of Public Policy student here at the Kennedy School. I worked in Australia over summer on the potential creation of an Australian nudge unit. Um, and throughout our consultations, one of the big challenges that we faced was determining the appropriate level of transparency for nudges. On one hand, there was a view that if the government's sort of acting covertly to change the choice architecture, then perhaps we need to be more transparent than we would ordinarily be in the regulatory process. But on the other hand, there's a view that by being transparent, maybe you undermine the nudge uh, in particular circumstances. I was wondering if you could maybe speak to the research on uh, whether transparent, well, I guess give a view as to whether you think transparency is crucial and to what extent it might undermine the success or the outcomes that we could otherwise achieve. It's a great question. We're big fans of transparency. So uh, as a first approximation, and it may be a really good first approximation, maybe even better than that, uh, transparency with respect to everything. So in terms of the things I worked on in government, there wasn't a single thing that was covert. So the fuel economy label was changed so that it tells people more concretely about the economic savings. Uh, and it doesn't highlight the MPG thing quite so much, which is hard to make meaningful. Completely transparent, part of notice and comment rulemaking. The efforts in the disclosure domain for credit cards, all that stuff went out for public comment, completely transparent. The, the, the switches in the default rules for various things, all transparent. So I can't think of a single thing that was hidden or covert. And the, 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 we talk in the book about uh, John Rawls's publicity principle, which actually has a, uh, a Kantian uh, justification. Don't do something if you couldn't do it publicly. And 
tell people. There's also a welfareist reason to do it. If you hide it and then it comes out, it's <laughs> going to create terrible problems. So I'm trying to think whether there are nudges that if it was disclosed that that's what you were doing, you'd undermine the effect. Well, and I, I can think of one. So the, the social norms letters uh, that the UK have been running, it, it, suppose after you tell people that 90% of the people in, in Cambridge pay their taxes on time, and then you say, uh, we added that sentence because evidence shows that if you read that sentence, you're more likely to pay your taxes. Uh, that's probably not a really good idea. Uh, but I think uh, uh, writing up the results that that's what you're doing, I, uh, I'm all for that. So uh, th certainly there's a big misconception out there, which is that nudges have to be secret and uh, to work. And I think most of the most successful nudges are completely public. Certainly my favorite one, and the one that has saved my life on numerous occasions on visits to London, are those signs that tell me which way to look <laughs> for <laughs> oncoming buses, right? I mean, they're, they're, it's not a secret. <laughs> <laughs> that it says, when it says look right, they want you to look right. And, you know, I found that to be pretty good advice. Hi. Um, my name is Annie Rack. I'm a sophomore at the college um, and directing the question to anyone of you four who would prefer to answer. But um, sort of feeding off the previous question, um, there's been a uh, substantial reaction from the members of the more conservative side of the political spectrum in the United States of uh, misconceiving the idea of a nudge or choice architecture of um, depriving people of the ability to choose. Um, and that's an idea that I know both of you guys uh, addressed um, in Nudge. But I'm just sort of wondering if you could discuss a bit um, what we can do to um, work against that misconception that choice, architect choice architecture is taking away our, our right to choose. Um, and, and along those lines, um, how we can do a better job of educating the general public of what behavioral economics is and what choice architecture is in a way that they can understand it and see it in a more positive light. How about yelling, no, it isn't. <laughs> that, that, that would be, see, he's the politician of the, of the team. Um, so yeah, this is unbelievably frustrating uh, to read that you know what these wives want to do is reduce your choices when the whole point of the book was to say, how far can we go if we tie one hand behind our back and say we're going to devise policies that don't reduce choices. Um, I don't know what else we can do but just keep repeating that and ig ignore the noise. Uh, but it's frustrating. Yeah, I found in, in Washington there, there's an abstract noisy debate and then there's real people working on stuff. And uh, uh, I, I, I found that I had very good relations with Republicans in the House and Senate. and. Uh, I didn't ha hear one of them ever say, uh, this nudging is really terrible. And it but then stop. there was your friend Glenn. Yeah, who's, who, who I don't think is in the House or Senate. And uh, Glenn Beck was not so happy with me. But uh, <laughs> the, you know, in the debate over the Affordable Care Act, just as one example, uh, the Republicans were urging, some of them prominently, instead of a mandate, there should be automatic enrollment in health care, subject to opt out. And uh, the, the idea of disclosure as a regulatory tool, certainly the idea of uh, experimentation and empirical analysis and taking away stuff that doesn't make much sense anymore, that the, Repub the latter the Republicans like just as much. So once we get away from abstractions, I think the word behavioral economics, I was stunned to find in Washington 
that it turned from something that had a little halo around it at one point to something that had like skull and crossbones. Yeah. I don't know what happened exactly in some circles. Maybe the word behavioral scared people. Um, uh, there is, there's a book out, it's not a bad book, it has a subtitle, uh, it's called Changing Behavior, a British book, The Rise of the Psychological State. I don't Ooh. think Dick consulted on that title. Oh, God. It's, 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 so it's a little bit, there's an affect that's associated with stuff. I think the best is just, you know, what Dick said, that to, to explain calmly that the idea is to substitute something that's choice preserving for a mandate. So the whole idea is to avoid the mandate, instead to allow people to go their own route. And then once that's said, then things get concrete rather than abstract. So, just, to, to the extent that, um, that you can, it's about offering products in a marketplace, for example, you can use willingness to pay as a way of indicating what people's demands are, because people have an idea of what they think someone should want. But in fact, they're showing that they want something else. We, we faced, when we were designing a commitment savings product, we faced a lot of criticism from people who said, I can't believe you're taking money away from poor people. Because what we were doing was to, to provide a choice that you could actually use, use this product. But once actually all those people saw the data of who was choosing that, who was voluntarily electing to do that, and then what happened to their savings, that changed that dialogue. Helper. Uh, Steve Helfer, Harvard Law School Library. Poor people tend to smoke at much higher rates than other Americans. And health officials have acknowledged that high tobacco taxes have failed to reduce smoking rates among the poor. If these taxes further impoverish, uh, for example, in New York City, the tax on a package of cigarettes is $8.50. If they further impoverish poor people, uh, would you say these taxes have more of a harmful effect than a beneficial effect, particularly weighing the massive generation of funds that the government takes from tobacco? Well, uh, our focus really wasn't on taxes, which is a non-nudge solution. So uh, I can describe a bit the approach that in the Obama administration, at least uh, on the regulatory side, was emphasized, which was graphic health warnings. Uh, a court, I regret this, a court struck down the graphic health warnings on First Amendment grounds. But there's, uh, there's evidence that graphic health warnings have benefits for people in all demographic groups. Uh, that's an area where we need to have more data. And the fact that uh, the court's invalidation of the rule, which as I say, I regret, it did have one feature which is abstractly attractive, which it said, you, it said you need more data. So the idea of figuring out data about what works and what doesn't in the domain of tobacco, that is extraordinarily important. One little footnote there is that there is data, not with respect to the graphic warnings on packages, but with respect to the graphic warning campaign that the CDC has engaged in, and I'll give a kind of tip of the hat to Tom Frieden, who's the head of the CDC, and I, I talk to him a lot. He's a wonderful public servant, and he's on top of a wide range of academic material. That set of um, uh, educational campaigns seems to be having a quite significant effect in reducing smoking. Up for front. Hi, my name's Nick Peavy. I am a junior in food science and applied economics at Virginia Tech, and I just wanted to know, where do you think you fall on the spectrum between human and econ? Uh, well, um, uh, on that spectrum, uh, Cass is certainly more human than me, <laughs> um, not on all dimensions, uh, but we're both solidly in the human camp. Sounds right. <laughs> Please. Uh, my name's Sek Tan. I'm a uh, student here at the Kennedy School. Um, quite a lot of governments have thought about how do they integrate um, nudge, I guess, theory and practice into the making of policy. A lot of them have created behavioral insights team, teams. And I think part of, I couldn't help but think that maybe when you went to London, you felt that the creation of 14 different behavioral insights teams in different agencies was a bit overkill. So my question is, to, how should governments think about institutionalizing um, nudge thinking into the creation of policy, what kinds of mechanisms or institutions should they set up for that? 
I, I think we're getting, I, I don't think I know the answer to that. I mean, yes, I, I, I was overwhelmed uh, at the idea. Uh, you know, this was three years after the very first meeting we had there, and now there are 14 in, uh, separate organizations, and uh, it's not clear what expertise people have in those things. Um, but at least they're thinking and um, trying. And, um, you know, I think th this is something uh, Maya <laughs> will have to think a lot about. Uh, you know, one, one thing that would be great, so in the team Maya's creating in the U.S., there's going to be some uh, high-quality academics coming in to provide support and it would one one way you could imagine is that the team the center team that provides uh, expertise to the uh, teams scattered around and um, so that that may be one but you know there are some some of these some agencies in the U.S. government are bigger than most national governments, so they're certainly uh, big enough to support their own team and have it be really high quality. So, I have a point about that, which is there are a lot of institutional options, and whether there should be in Nation X a dedicated team depends on a lot of stuff. Like uh, here's one example for you the. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, I hope some of you have benefited from this, has uh, created a global entry program, which is a uh, great simplification of air travel. So if you see TSA pre at the airports, if you're in global entry, you can get into TSA pre, and it's a great simplifier. And it, it has some kind of family resemblance to uh, material about cost minimization and about simplification and about making it easy. So the people at the Department of Homeland Security who were involved in that, to my knowledge, they weren't, you know, they, they didn't study uh, Thaler particularly. They didn't read Nudge so far as I know. But, but they, they had some sense of what, what was in the atmosphere about uh, how to make programs more sensible. And there are people in the Department of Energy and the, the Environmental Protection Agency who actually have read Thaler. And, and they, they aren't part of a behavioral insights team. They may know what Maya is doing, but, but, but the fact that they are educated in a wide range of things of which this is one is completely sufficient. I can tell you the person who designed that machine that you put your passport in and then put your fingers on did not read our book. <laughs> And for our last question. Hello, my name is Alyssa Pagel, and I'm from the University of Minnesota working on my undergrad. You mentioned a lot about the different skill sets necessary, that not everyone has the same technical skills. You might not have the same enthusiasm as well for nudging people towards social change. When you're working with these type of people, how do you encourage them to take on the mindset of nudging to reach these beneficial social advantages? I think it would be a little kind of aggressive if I decided, you know, there's a fellow member of the human race and I'm going to make her or him get all excited about nudging. I think it would be a little, little argumentative and abstract. So the, the question would be instead, you know, you have, let's suppose, a, a charity this, uh, that's, that's interested in child welfare and that's trying to do better. And the question is, what problems does it particularly confront? And then if you can think of something that will help them or work with them in a way that's you know, all ears to thinking what they're, that, that, that's, that's more an approach. I, I do think both in government and in the private sector to come, unless the person's already taken with an abstraction and on you know, the behavioral material is quite taken off and nudging too in some sectors. But, but to think what, what concerns them? You know, is, is, this, is, is this something where their, they, their company is failing? 
because of uh, an inability to connect with customers, or state government is not doing well at serving elder, elderly people. That, that, I think that's the, that's the way in. You know, let, uh, let me end with a, a, maybe a kind of surprising analogy, but something that I've been at least peripherally involved in is some efforts to introduce analytical thinking into the decision making of professional sports teams. Now this sounds like it's completely different, right? It's actually exactly the same. You, uh, you, you have some analytical tools and you have, in, in the case of professional sports, very rich, obstinate people who think they know everything and um, the, 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 the challenge is for the analyst to figure out a way of communicating his or her findings to the decision makers who think they know everything. And so I, I, I don't think that the challenges of implementing behavioral insights are very different than the challenges in implementing analytical insights or any other new ideas. And you need a portfolio of, of people. And the most successful people in, in this field are the ones that have figured out a way of communicating with the, the people who think math is scary and um, not possibly relevant to the decision about whether you should punt on fourth down. On behalf of the IOP and the Center for Public Leadership, I want to thank all three of you. Thank you, Nava, for joining me as a moderator. And, and Dick and Cass, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you.